first Sunday in Lent. And we have just come up and received the holy ashes of penitence. And we have been reminded by the Holy Church that we are but dust. And the dust we shall return. That is a very solemn way to begin this holy fast. To remind ourselves of our mortality and that we do not have a very long time. Even the very youngest here this morning, these children in arms, we do not have a very long time in this world. Subject which I just read to you, about which I just read to you in the Holy Gospel. That personage who came to our Lord in those forty days of his fast and three times tempted him. In other words, I want to talk about the devil. Satan. That old enemy of the human race that has been hounding the footsteps of mankind down through all these long and tragic centuries. I want to talk about that personage, that character, who is the origin of all the evil in the world and who is always ready to tempt, to tempt mankind. The devil has over the centuries often been a subject of jokes. And let me say at the outset, Satan is no joke. I will personally never listen to a joke about Satan. If anybody starts telling me a joke about somebody appearing at the gates of hell and old Nick coming up, I close my ears. Long ago when I was young, when I was studying in Germany, a professor of theology said to us in the class, never, never joke about the devil. It is one of the most dangerous things that you can do. Satan is no joke. He is a terrible reality of our human existence here on this planet. Now, we are Roman Catholics, and we believe in Satan. We believe in the devil. We believe in the devil because our blessed Lord believed in him and had an encounter with him in the desert. We believe in Satan because St. Paul taught the reality of his existence and his activities. We believe in Satan because the magisterium of the church and the witness down the centuries and Holy Scripture itself teach us that he is a terrible, terrible reality. Now, if we were over there in Archbishop Roach's organization, we should not have to believe in the devil. We could if we wanted to. But many prominent theologians in that organization openly scoff at the devil and say it's just an old superstition, an old wives' tale. Oh, how I wish it were. But over there, in that jurisdiction, Archbishop Roaches, you don't have to believe that. You can believe anything you like pretty well over there now and reject anything you like. The main thing you have to believe over there is this new conception, this new concept of love. Pronounce it Lou. Lou. Everything is Lou. 
If you have rules, everything goes. Just have lots of big bundles of rules. But I'm afraid it's not like that. We believe in love, caritas. The love of God, which comes down from heaven, and which permeates our existence, and which can exist among human beings. But we know that along with love there is justice, and there is sin, and there is the possibility of eternal damnation, as well as the possibility of eternal salvation with God. And we take all that very serious. And so we start off this holy season of Lent with this very grim recital of that forty days and forty nights in the desert. When our divine Lord three times confronted that satanic preacher. We believe that that duel in the desert was a real duel between two persons. It was not just an abstract matter of opposing good and evil, a theory of good with a theory of evil. It was far more grim than that. It was a real duel with two wills opposing themselves against each other. The two partners in that duel in the desert were the divine Son of God, our blessed Lord, the second person of the ever-blessed Trinity, very God of very God. And he lay there in the desert, hungered, weak, from his past. And then the sky darkened and that horrible bent shape appeared. And a cloud came over the sun and the birds and the beasts fled and the angels looking down from heaven hid their eyes at the horrible sacrilege going on below when that foul creature from hell appeared to God's divine son. Yes, it was a real duel between two real persons. And let us also be clear about this. Satan is not an abstraction. He is not just the principle of evil in the world. He is not just the sum total of all the evil that is in all of our hearts. And he is not a superstition. He is not just some bad-tempered leprechaun. He is not the witch of the West or a sort of a naughty tooth fairy. He is a horrible, filthy, loathsome, ghastly, unspeakable creature, a person. And he is out to get us. You can go up into the highest mountain. He'll follow you there. If you find the deepest pit that there is and scuttle down it, he'll be there to meet you at the bottom. He's everywhere. He knows the inside of your house. And he knows the inside of mine. He likes to be around churches. That's where he stops his big, his big game. The holier a person is, the more acceptable to Satan that he is. <clears throat> even comes into our churches. I should think that last night when the most holy sacrament of the altar was on this altar and people were here in adoration and the candles flickered and cast shadows in the church I should think that it's quite possible that lurking in those shadows was that bent and gruesome shame. Satan exists. And he works in this world of ours. Oh, how he works. 
He has been dogging mankind since that day in the garden, the garden of God, when our first father and our first mother fell into sin. And they were expelled, and we were expelled from God's paradise. And we were set out on a course of history that shall go on till the end of the world in a world of sin and desolation and tragedy and pain and death with Satan ever present. Cry for that lost paradise. Weep for this broken world of ours. Lament for all the hideous, horrible work of Satan in this world down the centuries in which we have cooperated and our forefathers before us and our offspring after us. That horrible chain of fomented in the world. Weep for that. Mourn for all the wreckage that he's caused in this world. How great Christian countries with ancient Christian civilizations, I'm thinking of Poland, have fallen into the hands of beastly, faithful, faceless creatures who oppressed us. Weep for that and lament for it. Weep for the great and horrible wreckage that Satan wrought in the great Roman Catholic Church that used to be. That was perhaps his greatest accomplishment in all the centuries since creation. Just think of it. Let's think of it just in terms of this one country, this great and glorious country, which means so much in the world, the United States. The church in this country was at the very apex of its power and influence. Catholic universities were flourishing across the country. A wonderful system of Catholic education. Churches were filled. The real possibility of the conversion of America to Roman Catholicism was at hand. And then what happened? That church committed suicide. There was some horrible, filthy death wish that bubbled up in its consciousness. And it threw away its glorious heritage and adopted the ways and the beliefs of the world. Who could have done that if it had not been Satan? That was Satan. Let us go back to the gospel for today. Our Lord, after his baptism, in the River Jordan, by the hand of St. John Baptist, went there to the Mount of Temptation, this horrible, bleak desert landscape. And there for forty days and forty nights he fasted in preparation for his divine ministry amongst men. And there Satan came. And Satan stood before him as he hungered and lay weak on the ground. And Satan in his oily and utterly repulsive voice said, if thou be the Son of God, make these stones bread. Satan loves to tempt us through our bodies, through the appetites that we have in our bodies, through the desires that are there and the passions that are there. That is a favorite point of attack and a very vulnerable part of our makeup. We, as Christians, followers of Christ, do not believe, as some religions do, that the body is evil. We believe that the body is good. The body is not in itself evil at all. It's part of us. This flesh of ours, this flesh has an eternal destiny, along with our souls. Because we believe in the resurrection of the body, we believe that someday, down there in eternity, God will take these bodies of ours, these bodies which carry on them the ashes of penitence, 
and which shall be dust in the ground, and God will glorify them, and they shall go on living as part of us. That is why we Christians are taught to take care of the body, even when it's dead. So Satan attacked our Lord there. He attacked him through the hunger that was afflicting him. And our Lord said, no. Man shall not live by bread alone. And let us carry that with us for the next 40 days until Easter time. And then Satan came along and attacked our Lord in another vulnerable place. Faith. We Christians, we people, we human beings, we weak, fallible human beings, find faith very difficult. Sometimes at least. We find it difficult to believe. We like to see with our eyes. And when we can't see with our eyes, Sometimes our faith flickers and becomes weak. And that's where Satan comes in. He loves to tackle us there. And he tells us, if you could just see something spectacular, you could believe. And so Satan came to our Lord and he said, he took him to the temple in Jerusalem and they went up to a high pinnacle, and he said, cast yourself down. No harm will come to you. You have angels looking after you. They'll take care of you. You won't even dash thy foot against the stove. That's the temptation that comes to us. If we could just see something, if we could see something spectacular, some miracle, we could believe. But our Lord replied, and he said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. We have to believe without spectacular things to re reinforce our faith. Then Satan came to him a third time. Now Satan hates God. <clears throat> Satan was an angel one time. He was a beautiful angel of light in heaven. His name was Lucifer. And that very name is a name that indicates light. Lucifer comes from the Latin word lux, which means light. The Spanish word luz. The Italian word luce. And he was Lucifer, a light and beautiful angel. And then in some manner, we don't know how, temptation came into his heart and he rebelled against God. Because he wanted to be God himself. He was jealous of God. And so he gathered some dissident angels around him. And they started a revolt. And they were tossed out of heaven. And then they constituted themselves as a hateful band of demons. And they set themselves up a horrible black kingdom of wickedness. Opposed to the kingdom of God. And Lucifer became their leader. Lucifer, star of the morning, how hast thou fallen? And this Lucifer, who once had been an angel, came to our divine Lord and said, just kneel down in front of me and worship me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. That's what Satan always wants. He wants to be worshipped as God. He wants to put himself in God's place. And since he has not succeeded in doing so, he hates God. Oh, how he hates God. And our Lord said, Only the Lord God took our worship and the God. And then Satan left him. He had been thrown out. Of the desert. Some of the saints, some of the very sensitive saints and holy men and holy women and hermits have sometimes had visions 
of Satan, of the devil. And in these visions, they've been given various versions of what he looks like. But remember, it doesn't make any difference what he looks like, because he's spirit. But they've seen horrible pictures of Satan in their visions. Dreadful, repulsive, disgusting things. I've read in some of the works by holy men, holy women, saints, especially of Russian and Eastern Byzantine saints, some of these visions they've had of Satan. And they've seen him there, this disgusting creature in front of them. A horrible, dark, scaly creature with rhinoceros horns coming out from all parts of his body with one vast, horrible red eye full of hate and immersed in a sea of sick and putrid vomit. That's disgusting. But Satan is more disgusting than that. Others have seen him as sort of a great dismembered piece of flesh, pale without any color, neutral, a sort of a giant goiter, with eyes all over his body, all filled with hate, and secreting a hideous pus. He's more horrible than that. <coughs> Others have seen him as a beautiful youth with golden hair and blue eyes and an angelic face and a gentle, sweet voice. And he beckons to them and says, Come to me. Come to me. And I will make you so, so happy. And then when the victim advances, the eyes, those blue, gentle eyes, turn to fiery points, filled with malignant hatred. And that voice becomes a coarse and rough voice that carries damnation. Satan is like that. Remember, he was once an angel. He has still some of the gifts of an angel. He has an angelic intelligence. He can deal with not only you and me, but with millions of people at once. He knows us right through. He knows where we're weak. Satan has dogged us down through history. He'll dog us all of our lives. He goes off to us from the time we're baptized till the time we receive extreme unction. He's always not far off. Sometimes, very often, he has used human beings as his instruments. Down through history, he's turned groups of men. He's looked at some of the injustices in the world, and there are many injustices in our world. And as followers of Christ, we naturally want to do what we can to try to do something about these injustices. Poverty, hunger, cruelty, war. But Satan has used these in his own purposes. He has gathered groups of men together in secret organizations, secret lodges, and they've plotted against society. They've wrecked great Christian countries. They've fomented revolutions with the cry of liberty, equality, fraternity. They were in Moscow in 1917 in the better caves. And the children, the three children at Fatima, received from our blessed and immaculate lady news of what was going on. So Satan has been working through these malignant forces in history. And he will go on doing so. And so many fall into that trap. So many. We are frail. Alone we cannot fight against him. We can only use what our Holy Mother the Church has given us to fight against him. But we're very strong. 
with our allies. And remember that we have our divine Lord. We have his holy and immaculate Father. We have St. Joseph. We have all the saints. We have the angels, the archangels, and all the heavenly hosts. And we need them. We cannot do without them. O oh Lord Kyrie, Lord Jesus, help us in the fight against Satan. Our Immaculate Lady, Queen of Heaven, Blessed Mary Immaculate, Mother of Mercy, help us in the fight. Help us through thy Holy Rosary. St. Joseph, patron of the Universal Church, Patrone Morientium, patron of the dying, help us fight against Satan. All ye holy angels and saints, come to our succor. I once went to the place where our Lord was tempted in the wilderness, where he spent those forty days and forty nights, and where Satan three times came to him and tempted him. It was near Jericho, near the Jordan River. And it's in a place which is 1,300 feet below sea level, the lowest portion of the earth, considerably lower than Death Valley in California. And I went down there on a July, I emphasize July day, and I don't know what the temperature was, but I know that I, the whole time I was there, and I was there a couple of days, I was wet from head to foot with sweat. I was suffocating from the heat. But I wanted to go to the place of our Lord's baptism and pray in the Jordan River, or by the Jordan River, and I wanted to go to the Mount of the Temptation. So I remember that hot, filthy heat it was, that hot July afternoon when I sat walking to the foot of the Mount of Temptation. Now, in the Middle East, there are many sh sheep and goats and they have very large shepherd dogs, which look after them. And believe you me, those dogs are fierce. I had several encounters with them, and I was quite frankly terrified of them. And when I was getting fairly near to the foot of the mountain where I had to start climbing, it's just a great big granite mount there, several of these dogs came running across the fields toward me. And uh, with Olympic speed, I managed to get myself up on top of a big rock. If I'd tried otherwise to get up that rock, I wouldn't have done so. But something about those dogs gave me extra strength. And I got up there and I waited, panting. And finally a little boy about this high came along and hit each one of them over the nose and they ran off, slinking. <laughs> so I got down and I started up the mountain. It took me, I suppose, about half an hour. It's not a very high mountain. It's just rock, not a blade of anything living on it. And up just below the top is a little Greek monastery built partly in a cave, a long cave, and the Greek monastery is not even as wide as this church, about two-thirds as wide. And it goes right along the mountain for a while, and four old Greek monks live there of the Greek Orthodox Church. And they spend their time there in that place of the temptation, praying for sinners. The struggle to get up that mountainside was terrible, in that heat. And I remember that when I got to the door of that monastery, I just gasped the one word, water. And the old monk handed me a clay, earthenware, I suppose it was, pot about this big with a top on it. And I drank the whole thing down. Now I thought that when I got up to that place where our Lord was for those 40 days, I thought that there I would feel that evil presence of Satan, because that's where he came. And I'm not particularly psychic, not at all in fact, but I thought, well, even my unpsychic self will feel Satan here. But when I got there, I didn't feel Satan at all. I felt peace. Lovely, divine peace. And 
and then I remembered, of course Satan's up here. The most mighty person in heaven and earth vanquished him here. He can't be here. He can never come there. That's one place on the face of the earth he can never set foot. Because our Lord defeated him there. And so, even in spite of the heat, my wet clothes with sweat, and the discomfort of it all, I sat down, then I knelt down when I had the strength to do so, and I prayed, Lord, give me peace. Someday, with God, I hope to have complete peace. Where Satan can no longer come, where I can be just with God and his saints. And so, this morning I have tried to introduce somebody to you. This is a formal introduction. At the beginning of this 40-day period, I want to introduce this gospel. Unspeakable, hideous, horrible obscenity. Satan himself, in all of his grim and hideous reality, there he is. We are told in the New Testament and in the office of the church at conference to be vigilant, to be sober. Sobri estote. Be sober. Vigilate. Be vigilant. Orate. Pray. Because your adversary, that enemy, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.